Well, hi all my friends. So I uh, did a little song last night. Finally, I still have this thing on my hand. Uh, and I'm gonna get x-rayed later on today to see how bad it is. Um, yeah, so we were uh, in Swedenborg on page 187 is the last time I, st I stopped on that page and um, <clears throat> uh, we're in the Swedenborg sampler uh, 187 and uh, we were talking about um, the book of true Christianity just having a little sample of this book um, and so um, just go back here a little bit Just to try to get you into this, kind of ease you into this. Um, you know, the, he was talking about sense oriented people and how they are uh, earthly in the lowest way. Okay, so remember, our, he, he would compare our bodies, the head being like heavenly and the feet being earthly, you know, or hell, hellish states, if you will. Um, just sort of kind of like a metaphor in a way. Um, but. Um, he was talking about the the, the church, um, although they're outward, outwardly able to speak in favor of them, things related to heaven and the church give these people ruling power. They are even capable of speaking ardently in favor of them. Um, let me see. Uh, let, me, let me go back here. S since the light they have is dense and earthly, people like this are inwardly opposed to things related to heaven and the church although they were outwardly able to speak in favor of them. If things related to heaven and the church give these people ruling power, they are even capable of speaking ardently in favor of them. Sense-oriented people are able to reason sharply and skillfully because their thinking is so close to their speech as to be particularly in it, almost inside their lips, and because they attribute all intelligence solely to the ability to speak from memory. So some of them can defend whatever they want. They have great skill at defending things that are false. After they have defended falsities, convincingly, they themselves believe those falsities are true. They base their reasoning and defense on mistaken impressions from the sense that the public finds captivating and convincing. Sense-oriented people are more deceptive and ill-intentioned than others. The inner areas of their mind are foul and filthy because they use them to communicate with the hells. The inhabitants of hell are sense-oriented. The deeper in hell they are, the more sense-oriented they are. The sphere of hellish spirits is connected to our sense impressions through a kind of back door. Sense-oriented people do not see anything that is generally true in the light. Instead, on every topic, they debate and argue whether it is so. From a distance, their arguments sound like grinding of teeth. The sound of teeth grinding are actually the result of falsities colliding with each other, falsity and truth in collision as well. This makes it clear that the grinding or gnashing of teeth mean what it means in the world, world uh, what it means in the word. Teeth corresponding to reasoning based on mistaken impressions from our senses. So the educated and scholarly who are deeply convinced of falsities, especially people who oppose the truth in the word, are more sense oriented than others. You, you notice that a lot with you know professors and stuff at universities, right? Howard Storm being one of them, you know, went before he had his near death experience. So that is not how they seem to the world. People who are sense-oriented are the foremost developers of heresies. For the more, most part, hypocrites, deceitful people, uh, hedonist, adulterers, misers are sense-oriented. The ancients had a term for people who debate on the basis of sense impressions alone and speak against genuine truths in the word in the church. They call them serpents of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Sense impressions mean things that impinge on our physical senses and are experienced by those senses. This point leads to a number of others. We are in touch with the world by means of sense impressions and with heaven by means of impressions on our uh, rationality, which transcends sense impressions. Sense impressions supply things from the physical world that serve the inner realms of the mind in the spiritual world. There are sense impressions that feed the intellect. There are various earthly objects that are labeled material. These are sense impressions that feed the will. They are called the pleasures of the senses in the body. Unless our thought is lifted above the level of our sense impressions, we have very little wisdom. Wise people think above the level of sense impressions. When our thinking rises above sense impressions, it enters a clear light, eventually comes into the light of heaven. From this light, we get the awareness of truth that constitutes real intelligence. The ancients knew how to lift their minds above sense impressions and take their minds away from them. If sense impressions have the lowest priority, they will help open a pathway for the intellect. When we extrapolate truths by method of extraction, on the other hand, if sense impressions have the highest priority, the pathway is closed and the truths are not visible to us except as if they were in a fog or in a dark light. Sorry, if they were in a fog or in the dark of night. <clears throat> For wise people, sense impressions have the lowest priority and are subservient to things that are deep inside. For unwise people, sense impressions have the highest priority and are, and are in control. This type of person can truly be called sense-oriented. These are sense impressions that have in common with animals and sense impressions that we do not have in common with animals. The more we lift our thinking above sense impressions, the more human we are. Without acknowledging God and living in his commandments, however, none of us can lift our thinking above sense impressions and see the truths that relate to the church if God is who lifts and enlightens us. When the three universal categories of love are prioritized in the right way, they improve us. When they are not prioritized in the right way, they damage us and turn us upside down. First, I will say something about the prioritization of the three universal categories of love, love for heaven, love for the world, love for ourselves. When I will talk about the inflow and integra integration of one into another, finally, I will discuss the effect of their prioritization on our state. These three loves relate to each other, as do the three areas of the body. The highest is the head, the middle is the chest, and the abdomen, and our thighs and lower legs. Feet make up the third. When, we, when our love for heaven constitutes the head, our love for the world constitutes the chest and abdomen, and our love of ourselves constitutes the lower legs and feet. When we are in the perfect state we are created to be in. In this state, the two lower categories of love serve the higher category the way the body and everything in it serves the head. Therefore, when a love of heaven constitutes the head, it this love flows into our love for the world, which is chiefly a love for wealth, and takes advantage of the wealth to do things our love for heaven also flows through our love for the world into the love for ourselves, which is chiefly a love of having a high position and takes advantage of that high position to do useful things. Therefore, an inflow from one love into the next allows the three categories of love to join forces in order to do useful things. Surely, everyone realizes that when people intend to do useful things because they are moved by spiritual love coming from the Lord, which is what love of heaven means. Their earthly self uses its wealth and other goods to achieve those useful things, and their sense-oriented self carries them out as part of their position and derives honor from doing so. Surely everyone who realizes all the things we do with our body, we do from the state of mind in our head, if our mind has love for acts of service, our body uses its limbs to perform acts of service. 
Our body will do this because of our will and intellect have the primary structures in our head and the um, wait, structures in our head and the derivations of those primary structures in our body so that our will is present in what we do and our thinking is present in what we say. Likewise, the reproductive impetus in a seed affects each and every part of a tree uses those parts to produce pieces of fruit as its act of service or for one other example fire and light inside a clear container make the container hot and bright in those people three categories of love have been prioritized in the right and proper way their mind's spiritual sight and their body's physical sight are translucent to the light that flows in through heaven and from our Lord, just as a pomegranate is translucent all the way through to the center where the seeds are stored. Something comparable is meant by following words of the Lord. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is whole, that is good. Your entire body is in full light. Matthew 6, 22 and Luke eleven thirty four. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is whole, that is good, and your entire body is in full of light. No one whose reason is sound could condemn wealth. Wealth in the general body politic is like blood in us. No one whose reason is sound could condemn the level of status that goes with different jobs. They are the mon they are the monarch's hands, the pillars of society, provided a spiritual love for status takes priority over an earthly, sense-oriented love for it. In fact, um, there are government positions in heaven and there are statuses that go with them. But because the people who fill these positions are spiritual, the thing they love the mo most is to be useful. When we take on a completely different condition we take on a completely different condition if love for the world or for wealth constitutes the head, meaning that it is our dominant love, then love for heaven leaves the head and goes into exile in the body. People who are in this state prefer the world to heaven. They do indeed worship God, but they do so from a love that is merely earthly, a love that leads them to take credit for all their acts of worship. They also do good things for their neighbor, but they do them to get something back in return. In the case of people like this, heavenly things are like the clothes in which they strut about, garments that we see as shining, but angels see as drab. When love for the world inhabits our inner self and love for heaven inhabits our outer self, then love for the world dims all things related to the church and hides them as if they were behind a piece of cloth. Love for the world or for wealth comes in many forms, however, and it gets worse the closer it approaches to miserlessness. At the point of the miserlessness, the, the love for heaven becomes dark. This love also gets worse the closer it approaches to arrogance and a sense of superiority over others based on love for oneself. It is not a detrimental when it tends toward wasteful indulgence. If it is less damaging, if its goal is to have the finest things the world has to offer, like a mansion, fine furniture, fashionable clothing, servants, horses, carriages, and grand style, and things like that. With any love, it, its quality depends upon the goal that it focuses on and intends to reach. Love for the world and for wealth is like dark crystal that suffocates light and breaks it only into colors that are dull and faded. It's like a fog or cloudiness that blocks the rays of sun. It's also like wine in its first stages. The liquid tastes sweet, but it upsets your stomach. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you um, t for all the comments lately. I really appreciate them, and I do hope that you have a good weekend too and that things are going well for you and your loved ones. Love you. Bye.